morning and welcome to Whitmix's webinar, Bites, Splints, and Guards of Mine. My name is Corey Lambertson. I'm the manager of technical support for Whitmix, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. I would like to begin with a few housekeeping items. First, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a questions box. Please feel free to type in a question at any time throughout the presentation, and our presenter, John, will be answering your questions at the end of the webinar. Next, if you are a CDT, this webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit towards your certification. You will receive an email within one to two days that will tell you how to obtain your credit. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, within 48 hours, it will be up on the Whitmix website in the webinar section. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing John Waters, who is Whitmix's own quality manager. John is our man when it comes to the FDA. Today, John will be covering dental laboratory obligations when it comes to medical devices in the digital age. So John, if you're ready, let's get started. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Corey, for that, for that introduction. Well, uh, folks, let's go ahead and get started with the, uh, with the presentation. Yes, the title of our um, presentation today is indeed Bites, Splints, and Guards, oh my. Um, as you can imagine, I probably got that title from The Wizard of Oz. I've actually talked to a couple of people here that have never seen that movie, so that, if, that may give you an indication of just exactly how old that I am. Um, so let me uh, get through this uh, just the first time using this screen. So yes, my name is John Waters. I am the Quality Assurance Manager for Whitmix. Some of the information you may see uh, refers to me as the Regulatory Compliance Officer, which is my title when I first started. Um, right now, it's Quality Assurance Manager. Call me anything you want, as long as you don't call me late for dinner. I have been in FDA compliance since 2005, so for roughly 14 years, I've had a lot of experience working in this field. I have six domestic and one overseas FDA inspections. And along with that, I have dealt um, internally through phone calls and emails. Um, so I have a lot of communication experience with the FDA. I, I shy away from saying I'm a professional in that because I don't know that there is anyone exactly a professional working with the FDA because sometimes they can be quite challenging to work with. I've participated in and conducted numerous ISO medical audits. I've dealt in class one and class two medical devices. I have not yet had the opportunity to deal in class threes, uh, so we won't be discussing that. And lastly, as far as me personally, um, for those of you who know about the what they call the MedSAP or the MDSAP certification program, Whitmix went through the stage one and stage two audits of that earlier in this year, and we have been recommend, been recommended for certification. So as soon as our registrar gets caught up on a lot of their backlog paperwork, we will be receiving that in the mail, hopefully within the next month. So I'd like to talk about some of the objectives of this webinar. And first, it's <clears throat> just what are bite guards, night guards, and splints. There's been some buzz about that in the dental community lately. And so we want to touch on that, especially from a, um, a dental lab's perspective. We want to talk about how they are similar, um, what terminology is used to describe one or multiple of these. The really important is how are they classified by the FDA? Since we all in the dental community, in some form or fashion, we work under the auspices of the FDA. So this is a, a very important thing to know. What the, op what the FDA obligations are required for dental labs. <clears throat> Excuse me. And lastly, what cost does that mean to you? So looking at just what are bite guards, night guards, and splints. If the, on, on the screen that I have displayed here, um, we see the company, the device name, the 510K number, and the product code. So Whitmix Corporation, our newest device, which is our Verisplint, 
has a 510k number of K190107. Now what that means is, is that the, the, the clearance was granted in the year 2019 and we are the 107th um, 510k application that they processed. Um, our product code, which I'll get into in a little bit, is our um, Whitmix has two product codes for this device. We have an MQC and we have EBI as well. So the MQC is the primary reference code, or excuse me, the primary product code, and the EBI is our reference product code. The second device we see is for Migrant Therapy LLC. They have a device called the Brooks. PMD quick splint. Their 510k number is K111066. They have a product code also with MQC. So this 510k was granted in 2011. The next is from Vertex Dental is an eGuard. If you notice the 510k number is considered, I've put here NA because it is not applicable, and it's considered a class one medical device. So most class ones need no 510K. And the product code for the Vertex is the DYT. Glidewell, most people have heard of Glidewell in the dental, in the dental industry. Uh, they have a product called Thermoform Mouth Guards. <clears throat> Excuse me. Their 510K number is K121365. Meaning this clearance was granted in 2012. Their product code is also MQC. And then the last that I have in, in this information is the Brux Night Guard. Their device name is called the Brux Night Guard. The 510K number is K181361. So this 510K was cleared in 2018. And the product code is MQC. Now there are literally thousands of dental devices on the market. This is just um, a quick snapshot of five that I pulled up. And all this, the information that you see is information that I pulled up off of the web on the FDA data, on some of the FDA databases. So this of information is available to anyone. So let's talk for a minute about how they are similar. Well, the term bite guard, splint, night guard, it seems to be used interchangeably throughout the dental industry. One can pull up many 510K applications and it depends on the, the, the literature, it depends on the terms used by the manufacturer of what they call it. But these three seem to be used very much interchangeably. For the most part, uh, the devices are used for protecting teeth by treating bruxism. Um, however, some of them are also used to treat TMJ or temporomandibular joint issues. And others are in, in the industry are targeted towards sports medicine to protect the teeth while uh, people are playing in certain type, type of uh, aggressive sports. So how are they classified by the FDA? As noted previously, the FDA has several product codes manufacturers have to choose from. In the dental industry alone, um, the last I looked, there is well over 200 product codes, depending on the device. But along with the various product codes, uh, there are associated regulation numbers. Now these regulation numbers dictate how the FDA views these devices. Depending on the, the product code and the regulation number, it will determine whether your class device is a class one, a class two, or a class three. So previously when we were looking at um, the, the various dental devices and the manufacturers, if you notice that the, the, the most recurring product code was MQC. Well, the FDA is what um, makes up these product codes. And as you, as you can see for the product code, um, the, the device, it is called a prescription mouth guard. 
and the review panel is from the dental. And the reason they have dental in the re in for the review panel, because it, if it were some other type of device, it could be a cardio cardiovascular, it could be for neurology, it could be for oncology, what are, whatever the review panel is, that shows up in the description. And again, this particular code is MQC. Now, this is a, a very um, unique product code for the FDA. It, it's, it's not alone. Uh, it says it's unclassified. So the device class, as I you know, previously, I had said that there are three de device classes, class one, two, and three. However, this one is unclassified. And we'll get to that here momentarily to explain that. The submission type, if you want to market this device, it does require a 510K. But because it does not have a device class, it has no regulation number. Again, there are others like this in the industry, um, but this is uncommon. Now let's look for a moment at the product code EBI. The device name from FDA, it says it's a resin, denture, relining, repairing, and rebasing. Again, the review panel is dental. The product code is EBI. Now this is a class two medical device and it requires a 510K submission if one wants to market it in the United States. And since it has a device class, it also has a regulation number, 872.3760. Now, the regulation number is important because it gives additional information describing the, this particular product code. And the, if you notice the regulation number says 872, all dental product codes start with that prefix 872. If it was a cardiology or, or some other type of panel, it would have a, a different three digit prefix. But for this particular product code, the regulation number, it specifies that this is a denture, relining, repairing, or rebasing resin is a device composed of materials such as methyl methacrylate intended to reline a denture surface that contacts tissue, to repair a fractured denture, or to form a new denture base. This device is not available for over-the-counter use, and the classification is a class two. So if a person is, um, whether it be a, a manufacturer or a dentist, or could be even in a lab, that wants to think of a new device, and if it, fit, if, if it falls into any of these categories of the denture, as far as relining, repairing, or rebasing, you would use this product code EBI in your 510K submission. The next product code is DYT. This is a, uh, it's called a maintainer or space preformed orthodontic. And since it has a device class being a class one, if you notice it says 510K exempt, meaning if a person wants to market this in interstate commerce in the United States, they do not have to file a 510K for it. And its regulation number is 872.55. To five. Again, the, for any dental product, the three digit prefix is 872, and the other numbers are sequential to FDA, and, how, and however this, um, the description comes about, it just gets a sequential number. Now, for this particular code, it is a preformed tooth positioner of a plastic device that is an impression of a perfected bite intended to prevent a patient's teeth from shifting position or to move teeth to a final position after orthodontic appliances, like parentheses braces, have been removed. The patient bites down on the device for several hours a day to force the teeth into a final position or to maintain the teeth in their corrected position. Again, classification, it's a class one. And in that parentheses, it says general controls. And it goes on further to explain the device exempt from the pre-market notification procedures in subpart E, which, so if, when this says it's class one general controls, that means it's exempt a lot from the quality system regulation 
as FDA defines it. Now, if you have a question about product codes, wh where does one find the product codes? Well, here's a snapshot um, that I have provided. It, the, the link is right at the top of the page, uh, www.accessdata.fda and all the, the acronyms that follow that. But the product codes come in alphabetical order. And here's a snapshot showing the, the one that I have highlighted is DYT, Maintainer Space Preformed Orthodontic. It says it's a preformed tooth positioner. It gives its regulation number, and it tells us device class over to the right. So that way, when someone is either researching about medical devices or wants to design a new medical device, they can look to this as a guidance to find a lot of the information they need in order to classify it or the regulation numbers that they need um, to get reference to when communicating with the FDA. So what does 510K unclassified and exempt mean? What, what are these things and, how are, and, and what do they deal with the dental devices? Well, medical devices for the USA, as I said, come in three classes, class one, class two, and class three. But an unclassified device usually means that it was, it was a device in use prior to 1976. Prior to 1976, while the FDA was in existence, it did not have the regulating power and enforcement as it did after that date. So if it is exempt, again, it's meaning they were legally marketed in the U.S. prior to that date, and the device has not been significantly changed since then. So if a person were want to, wanted to design a device that was currently unclassified, basically means a, a me too, it's, it's, it's my particular type of that device. If you wanna make significant changes, significant modifications, enhancements to it, you would need to file a 510K. Now, some may ask, well, it says it's 510K exempt. While that is true, the key indicator is making key enhancements or improvements. Once a person does that and gets their 510K, while it may seem unfair, any other manufacturer that wants to make a Me Too device, like the one that has the enhancements or improvements, do not need a 510K now. Again, while that may seem unfair, that's that's the rules, and, and all we have to do is live by them. <laughs> so, as I had mentioned, um, the medical devices come in class one, two, and three. And for those, just for your information, if you're interested in other markets, um, Health Canada comes in four classes, class one, two, three, and four. And Europe has class one, 2A, 2B, and 3. Those are the three medical device manufacturer players. Uh, there are others in throughout the world that some still have the classification as the US. Some mimic the Europeans, but they all seem to come in either three to four device classes. So what does 510K unclassified and is it mean? Medical devices for the USA come in the three classes. Again, they were unclassified before the 1976 date, but class one devices are usually exempt from 510K, meaning they have a very significant low risk, so they don't fall under the same regulations as a class two or above. So if a person wants to market and or sell a class one device into interstate commerce, they have to list that device. First of all, they have to have a facility registration. Then they have to list that device under their registration, but they call it, they list it as a class one. If it were a class two needing a 510K, the FDA would pick up on that in the device and facility registration, and they would ask you where that five, where is the 510K before you can market the device. One of the things um, some people are not aware of is that the FDA actually monitors um, websites 
to see what kind of products people are, are advertising, whether it be medical devices, um, um, therapy, a new regulation that has really um, hit the FDA is uh, smoking and, and smokeless products. While it has anything to do with, with the medical devices, that's just another field that they are involved in. Class two devices usually require 510K, however, not always, in order to legally market it in the United States. So like my previous statement, while there are a lot of guidelines that generally, generally dictate the regulations for devices, there is never a one size fits all. So uh, I think the biggest question that people have tuned in is, what are the FDA obligations required for dental lab? What are you required to do for the FDA? Well, as many of you probably know, if you're only manufacturing crowns and bridges, you, while, while you are required to operate your business in compliance with the FDA regulations, you don't have to register your business with the FDA and you don't have to list the medical devices. If a dental lab is performing manufacturing for even dental sleep medicine, okay, so now we're just, we're beyond just the plain crowns and bridges. If you're doing it for dental sleep or other class two dental medical devices, however, you're operating under the direction from a dental doctor, like a dentist, could be an orthodontist, FDA registration is still not required. If the dental lab manufactures an appliance for interstate commerce. So if you have, in the case of Whitmix, like we have marketed our Veris, you have now assumed the role of the manufacturer. So that means you have to list your facility and the devices you are selling with the FDA. In this case, if the only device we were um, advertising for interstate commerce is the Veris Flint, you could go into the FDA, some of the databases, and you would see that Whitmix is listed with the FDA and that we are also listed to sell this particular uh, class of device. The key in all this is what services the lab providing? To sum it up, if it is to serve a dentist, the lab does not assume the role of the manufacturer. But if you are marketing a device to an end user on your own without the direction of a dentist, you have now assumed the role of a manufacturer. Now, that isn't to say that only the role of the manufacturer. There are other roles that may be implied uh, towards the dental lab or other facility. And I'm going to, uh, to discuss those as well. So when I said, you know, that if you are required to register and list, registration and listing, just what does that mean? Well, if you are, if you are the manufacturer, that's one designation that you could be considered. Another is being a specification developer, meaning that you don't actually manufacture the device, but you have come up with the specifications that it takes to make it and then you hire someone else to make that device for you. Another one is repackage or relabeler. You don't market the device. You don't manufacture it. You're not the specification developer. However, either one of those may come to your business because maybe you have a, a, a great packaging and um, where you could they could put devices and that are intended for the sterile market where possibly the manufacturer may not have that. So they could come to someone and say, can you package this for me? And it's because I want to sterilize it and then, and then you can resell it. If that is the case, you have now assumed the role of being a repackager and a relabeler. There's the contract manufacturer, whom is a specification, like I had said before, a specification developer may develop the specifications, but not the ability to manufacture this device. So they will hire someone else to make this for them. So in all these things that I just mentioned, again, this is this uh, there's um, this is just an a sample. It is in all the activities 
that a dental lab or a dental manufacturer could have. But just what, do, what does the FDA call them? Well, first of all, you could be a component manufacturer that are not otherwise classified as a finished device that are distributed only to a finished device manufacturer. But that's a lot of words. It simply says that in the case of, we'll just use Whitmix because that's the one I'm most, most familiar with, our articulators are class one medical devices. Now, if we hire someone to make that articulator for us, they would be a contract manufacturer. But the articulator itself has many pins, it has condylar guides, it has plates, it has um, some nuts and washers and, and scribe lines. If we hire somebody to make those components, they are just a component manufacturer. They do not need to list and they do not need to register with the FDA. A contract manufacturer is defined when you manufa manufacture a finished device according to another establishment's specifications. A specification developer develops the specifications for a device that is distributed under the establishment's own name but performs no manufacturing. So that is, um, that's a very common practice. On the label, you will see that the device, it may say manufactured for someone or distributed by someone. And so in that case, sometimes that entity is the specification developer and not necessarily the manufacturer. But a manufacturer is defined by FDA. A manufacturer makes by chemical, physical, biological, or other procedures any article that meets the definition of device according to the FDA. And the I did not uh, explain the definition of device, but it's available on the FDA website. So who needs to register, list, and pay the fee? And I talked a little bit ago about um, depending on your activity, whether you need to list your facility, whether you need to list your devices. One thing I haven't touched on yet is paying the fee. So in, in our list of activities possible that I have shown here, we have contract manufacturer. Are you required to register with the FDA? Yes, you are. That is if you are manufacturing that finished device according to someone else's specifications. Are you required to list the devices you are manufacturing? Yes. And yes, you are also required to pay the fee. As I explained earlier, a component manufacturer does not need to register, list, or pay the fee. A manufacturer needs to register, list, and pay the fee. Initial importer has to register. They do not have to list the devices, but they do have to pay the fee. And again, this information um, is readily available on the FDA website. And again, at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation, if, um, or if you want to just email me with some helpful information I can provide to you, I'd be glad to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. And so in, in, in the wrap up, one of the things you need to ensure is you know your role in regards to the devices that you sell, service, or make and understand your responsibility in regards to registering, listing, and paying the fee. And there is uh, something I wanted to mention in this last slide that I didn't about paying the fee. How much is the fee? Who, who, who comes up with the fee? The fee is um, every year it's developed between the FDA and Congress. And as a general rule, that fee goes up every year. Um, I think the last year, I think the, the fee for 2019 was the same as 2018. Don't hold my word to that because I'm going off memory. But I believe the cost for 2020 is $4,700 plus. Dollars. So we're, we're approaching that $5,000 mark just to list your facility with the FDA. So it's very important to know what role you play in, re in regards to whether you need to register, list, and or pay the fee. And I believe that's the last of my presentation. Um, lastly, just know your product codes and how the devices are classified. And that's the end.
So I'm going to hand it back to for a second to court. Awesome. Thank you, John. I appreciate your, your presentation. It's very good. So let's see if we have any questions here. Uh, let me drag this out real quick. So I don't see. Oh, wait, here we are. Let me open this up a little bit bigger so we can have access to it. All right, somebody said not seeing the screen, says wait and what makes screen. Okay, do pro forma chill products need 510K? Well, um, what I would suggest you do is is email me after the presentation. I'd have to actually know, you know, what do you mean by a pro forma material? Um, again, that depends on its product code and classification. And I would be happy to help you walk through that to see if it does. Um, we, we have another question that says, does zirconia have to be FDA 510K approved? Um, that is a, um, I, I just like to, to step up on a soapbox here for a, little, for a little bit. A lot of people, they speak of FDA or 510K approval. Just keep in mind, FDA approves nothing. Um, when you get a 510K, your 5, that doesn't mean your device is approved by the FDA. What that means is, is you had an idea for a device, you presented it to the FDA in a 510K format and they agreed with it, so they have cleared it. And so, and that's all that means. It means that you, you now have the ability, they are giving you the licensure to sell that device within the United States, but, it is, but they, the FDA does not approve any 510K. But in answer to the question, Zirconia, as a general rule, needs 510K approval uh, because it falls under a class two device. Um, the next question is, would you have to list with the FDA if you're outsourcing work to another country? Now that's a, um, that's a, a, I'm not saying that the person presented as a loaded question, but what it, if you are, if, if you have another country manufacturing products for you and they are only a component manufacturer then no they don't need to register and they don't need to list um, if they are however performing a contract manufacturing um, specification developing any of that other work yes that other country is supposed to be listed with the fda as a matter of fact if you go that there is a specific part of the fda it, it's it's called who needs to register list and pay the fee if one just goes into their in google and says who needs to register list and pay the fee to fda it will direct you to a, a fda website that shows you the activities performed either domestically or overseas and that will tell you whether that country needs to list and whether they need to pay the fee or not um, next question is what about printing of appliances same logic um, I can tell you that yes, that is the same logic. And it really falls under the same logic of is it 510K exempt or not? Some devices that traditionally had been, and was, since it's so new to the, to the industry, there's one thing I would, first thing I would advise you to do is look up the FDA's um, additive manufacturing principles. Because it's so new, and so to the note new to the industry, FDA has developed a separate guideline about if you are going to develop a device used by additive as opposed to subtractive manufacturing, it gives you a whole litany of a list of things that you need to do that you need to consider. Uh, that document is a document that um, Whitmix relied heavily on when we submitted for and got our 510K uh, cleared on our Veris one. Uh, so the question is just, <laughs> they seem to be populating now. Um, do the direct to consumer aligners, such as Smile Direct Club, have to obtain a 510K? Um, since I am just, you know, as, as Corey said, I'm, I'm the FDA guy, FDA guy here at Whitmix, I would have to look into that. Um, I know that some aligners, um, do and simply because it, it depends on the product code and the spe specification as how the manufacturer lists those. 
because once you go from uh, again the, there's the terminology is used interchangeably <clears throat> yet when you get into the term orthodontic that usually refers to the position of the teeth either shifting the position or keeping the position as opposed to protecting the teeth those type of devices usually require 510k approval um, again if you want to email me i'd be glad to speak with you one-on-one -on -one about that uh, we have another question says would you have to register as a relabeler relabeler repackager if you outsource crowns bridges to another country well here's what you have to keep in mind fda is only concerned about the devices sold in the united states if you were selling devices it, if you could you could make a um, basically any class medical device in this country that you want but if you don't market it in the united states then the fda regulations do not concern you um a lot of people think that they have to operate either this way or that way I will advise you that if you are marketing them to another country, now the, the, now you follow the other country's regulations. That's what you have to do. Um, I can tell you that what the what the um, Chinese has what they call the Chinese FDA, and their regulations are some in some regard more stringent than that of the United States. So you really need to check with that other country's um, regulations to see how that would may or may not affect you. And right now we have the last question that says, is there any scope of practice protection for the dental tech to take a raw material and fabricate a custom medical device? Or can any, let's see, can you help me see the rest of that, Corey? Oh, sorry. There's an office on and it stops right there. Yeah, I'm trying to get it to. We're experiencing a little tef technical difficulty. Corey's giving me a hand here to try to expand on this last question. There. There, I think I can see it now. It says, is there any scope of practice protection for the dental te technician to take a raw material and fabricate a custom medical device? Or can any dental, I guess that's dental professional, fabricate an office under the direction of the doctor? Um, I, I don't honestly know how to answer that. I, I will, I can tell you that there are regulations specific to custom medical devices, and they're pretty specific. Um, if if you if um, if a dental technologist were doing a device. For the doctor and the doctor says well this is custom because it's it's custom to this patient well to be quite honest um our varisplint resin you know used to manufacture guards that appliance will be specific and custom to every individual but it's not considered a custom device it's not considered a special device because it can be made to fabricate the device for anyone the custom regulations are again they're very specific and i would advise you to to uh to read and consider what those regulations are before you consider uh, making that but one of the reasons they call it practicing medicine is because a dental professional can pretty much take they can they can buy a device even for something that it's not used for and they can have um they can alter it they can change it to some degree because they are the professional but as having um as an, and as long as you operate under under that uh, auspices of you are following the directions of the dental professional that usually is the caveat to protection and i hope that answered your question again now that's all the questions that we have again if if um because sometimes seeing the it's better to have a conversation or have an email conversation where I could give you more specific answers. Again, if you want to uh, email me, I would be glad to do that. Um, but as far as right now, that's all the questions that we had. Corey, okay. John, what is your email address in case they they want to email you? Sure, it is J Waters. That's J W A T E R S at whipmix.com. Very good, awesome. Thank you, John. I appreciate your time today. 
Uh, once again, if you have any questions, please send us an email and we'll be more than happy to answer them for you. And once again, thank you for attending this WhatNext webinar and we hope you all have a wonderful week.